Welcome to the Swim Swam Podcast. I'm your host, Coleman Hodges. Joining us today, Dr. Amanda Sovic Johnston. She is a clinical psychologist. She owns, she's the CEO of Virginia Family Therapy, a mental health practice focusing on teens and athletes. Uh, and today we're talking to Amanda about mental health, specifically mental health and swimming. Uh, Amanda, thanks for coming on the podcast. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm so excited, Coleman. Actually, this is something I think about a lot. So I'm so excited to actually have someone listen to me potentially about my thoughts. put out an article on swim swam mental health for swimmers it details uh 10 points that amanda think thinks are really important uh, for the mental health of any swimmer today we're going to dive in depth on a few of those points we've got three points to to go a little deeper than just that article today um so amanda let's get started there we've got three points to, to discuss today what's number one for us So I think, number one, I think it's really important for us to acknowledge overall that there's been an increase in the awareness around mental health and and the difficulties with mental health among athletes. I think athletes are coming out more and more, and I'm so thankful that they're really leading, some really elite athletes are leading the way and saying, hey, performing at this level is really, really hard and it's demanding on my mental health. And sometimes I even have to stop. Um, because it's so hard. And I'm so thankful that there are so many athletes that are saying these things so that more people know that it's okay to ask for help. I think the first thing that I want a lot of athletes to know is that anxiety is a part of the game. And in being an elite athlete, being a successful athlete, we are really using our anxiety to fuel and motivate our performance, right? You have to have a lot of anxiety to make sure you you set your alarm in the morning. You are really paying attention when your coach tells you to do like one extra kick off the wall. You have to be pretty anxious in order to kind of think about your splits and know how to think that's anxiety. That's what's fueling us to be better. The important part is knowing when that anxiety is getting in your way. When is it becoming too much and the stress and pressure is beginning to weigh down on you? Does that make sense, Coleman, when I talk about how anxiety is our motivation and our need to do better? Absolutely. I mean, even thinking about uh, specifically a race setting, right? It's like you hear elite athletes talk about, well, of course I get butterflies, I get nerves, um, but that's good, right? I, I want to be nervous so that I know that I'm caring. And it sounds like, you know, a certain amount of anxiety when, as you said, your, your coach is telling you one more dolphin kick, you're focusing on what you're doing. You're, you're putting energy and effort into what you're doing. Um, it, it, it uh, n- you know, necessitates a certain level of anxiety, um, which, yeah, that makes sense. But again, what, you know, what's the line between enough and too much? Yeah, I think that's a really, really hard question. And I think that that is really specific to each individual and where they are and who they want to be. I think if we're talking about the really, really elite athletes, I think there's going to be a period in their life where maybe they say, I'm going to have to live with a lot of anxiety right now in order to meet my goals, right? Like if you're training to to make the Olympic team, you just kind of have to say, the next six months, I'm going to have a ton of stress and pressure and I'm going to feel anxious. And I know that I'm going to put some plans in place to be able to manage that better. But I think that that is a part of the experience. And once we name that, it can actually take some of the power away from that feeling. I think the other piece is if maybe that's not what you're going for and you're in high school or you're a college swimmer, really, you're really kind of getting into territory that could be more problematic if you're having difficulty sleeping, if you're not having fun, if you're getting really, really rigid about your routines, if if you're really monitoring what you're eating. I think that's something particularly important to talk about when we're talking about swimmers who are in bathing suits all day. Um, really a a lot more and more athletes across the board are talking about developing eating disorders. And that is one of those symptoms when the anxiety has kind of gotten 
too big and gone too far, it's really time at that point to start thinking about looking for some help. And I think, uh, you know, you hear a lot of elite athletes in any sport talk about training or talk about competing at the highest level. It takes a lot, right? As you said, you have to put yourself in a different place mentally, um, let alone physically than you would otherwise, if you're just going about your day-to-day life or, you know, competing at, at a, at any level that isn't that, that highest of high. Right. And I mean, that's why people take long breaks after the Olympics, Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, after, you know, winning a championship or something like that, because it's like, they need, they need that decompression. They need that time to just be themselves again and not be extremely stressed or have having that high level of anxiety. And so I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and so what do you think some of the signs are that, you know, you can have this good amount of anxiety and you can have too much. Um, if, if someone's listening to this, what are some signs that, okay, maybe this is too much anxiety. I need to change something up. I think that's a great question. I I think, you know, you just published an article about a woman who was having panic attacks before every meet, I think. And she didn't realize she was having panic attacks. She thought she was having an asthma attack, um, which makes sense. So I think panic attacks are absolutely something. And by the way, when we're talking about anxiety, y'all, this doesn't mean that, oh, it's too much. You have to back off of swimming. It's really like, oh, it's too much. Let's figure out different strategies. You know what, you know? So part of it is saying, oh, I don't want to live my life this way. Let's come with enough, come up with a strategy to manage the anxiety so that I can keep swimming this successfully, but it doesn't feel as bad. Right. So the hope would be to be able to manage the anxiety better, not to take the swimming and the competition away. But those signs would really be really monitoring what you're eating, like counting calories, not eating enough. Um, If you're having a hard time, like you're ruminating about your times, you're ruminating about um, splits or what happened at swim practice that day, or you're anxious about what's going to happen at swim practice the next day, you can't really stop thinking about swimming those are, those are just some signs and symptoms that you, you need another strategy in order to kind of have more fun in the sport. Cause that's what we want. That is what we want, right. Is, is to enjoy swimming. Um, you talk a lot about that in the, these 10 things. And that's something I really, that's a theme I really enjoyed about them is that, um, is that the, the primary purpose of swimming and of sports is to enjoy it. Right. And to have fun. Um, and then competition, in theory come second, but I think we know a lot of times that's not necessarily the case, especially when you're competing at the highest level. Absolutely. I'll tell you why I know this Coleman is because I was training for masters nationals, like, I don't know, three years ago, pre-pandemic and my swim coach, who is the great Don Easterling of NC state. I have to give him, he's my master swim coach. Now he's like 89 and he is amazing and has done so much for me. But one day he was like, okay, on Monday, you're going to do a 200 fly for time. I just want to see where you are. And I am not lying to you, Coleman. I thought about that 200 fly all weekend. I was so anxious about it. I was like, I'm going to have to take it out in the 30. I'm going to have to bring it home in this. And I just like thought and thought and thought and like, I have kids. I have three children who are ultimately way more important to me than a time trial in the 200 fly for master swimming, right? Like I love swimming, but it's not everything to me. And so being able to say, this actually isn't how I want to be spending my time. Let me put it away. That was really empowering for me, but it's because I'm a psychologist and I'm 40 that I was able to think like that. Like you don't have to spin about some you know, test set that you have coming up in three days. And I feel like some coaches, they want that, right. They, they tell you, okay, we have this set in advance and then they kind of see how athletes respond to it, um, without maybe giving the athletes those tools of, okay, here's, here's the set we're doing. And then also here's how I would like to see you respond to Mm -hmm. having this information. Um, Mm -hmm. But I, yeah, it's, it's a good lesson to learn. And I think um, there's a myriad of ways to do it. I, I know one way you talk about is journaling right after a swim practice oh, yeah. to kind of leave it, 
uh, leave the swim practice, you know, in the notebook at the pool and then move on. Yep. Write those splits down, close the notebook. And then next time you think about the splits that you need, be like, oh, I already wrote that down. I don't need to think about it again because that's how you're going to have balance, right? We can't just be swimmers all of the time. We have to have other identities that are going to protect us from the ebbs and flows of swimming, which is actually, I didn't even mean to transition Coleman, but here we are. Um, I've transitioned to my second point, which is making sure we know who we are outside of the pool. Right. And, and I think that's really important for teenagers and young adults who are swimming because they, the whole job of teenagers and young adults is to figure out who you are, to figure out your identity. Are you a swimmer? Are you a friend? Are you a people person? That's what you're supposed to be doing in those ages. And when you're spending three hours a day at the pool, you might think I'm just a swimmer. That's just who I am. And so when you're not swimming well, it feels like you don't even know who you are. And that can feel really, really devastating. So the kind of antidote to that is to really recognize all the people and all the things that you are when you're at the pool. So one is you're an athlete, right? Like you're swimming, you're about the sport, you're about how fast you're going. And that's one part of who you are, but you're also a teammate. You're a really good friend while you're there. So you can think about what kind of, what kind of friend am I while I'm here? Am I a leader? Am I kind of a quiet shiner? You know, what, what's my role as a friend while I'm here? I have, you know, I actually really loved coaching summer league swimming. Um, it was like where I shined. I'm really good at leading cheers for some reason. Um, actually I know why it's cause I'm loud and I talk a lot, but I'm really good at, but I didn't realize that that was going to lead me into the field of child psychology. I loved kids as a summer league coach. And here I am as a child psychologist, but I didn't know that that's what I loved about it at the time. And I wish I would have kind of broken that down. And if I would have, when the swimming wasn't going as well, it would have felt a lot easier for me to be like, okay, I'm not swimming my best times, but I'm really developing in my people skills here. And I'm really proud of that. And that I love that you started summer league coaching and, and then that transitioned into your career, you know, so another case of swimming, leading someone to, you know, a different career path, but yeah, I totally agree. I remember when I was 17 or 18 my goal in life was to be a professional swimmer. Right. And that's what I wanted to do. Having no idea what that actually entailed or, you know, the steps you needed to take to do that, um, or even the level of skill involved in doing that. But, you know, I was a swimmer at that point, that was my identity. And so that's what I wanted to do. Um, and luckily, you know, by the time I was done with high school, I had other interests and other things that kind of formed my identity and that I could follow, uh, instead of swimming. But I think it's really easy to get wrapped up in that, uh, sense of identity when, as you said, you're spending so much time at the pool, um, which is kind of a whole nother thing that I think, um, coaches are recognizing a lot more. I think the swimming community is recognizing how time consuming swimming can be as a sport, especially, with younger kids or even high school kids. And maybe that's not totally necessary, but that's kind of a different topic. Um, so, so outside of the pool, um, you kind of mentioned some ways that you or, or identities you have as a swimmer or when you're at the pool that aren't being a swimmer outside mm-hmm. of the pool, how do you develop or how would you suggest, um, kids develop these other identities? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I think the way all kids do, right? The way all human beings, we naturally do, we try something, we see how it feels. And then if we like it, we keep going with it. And that's how a lot of people stick with swimming is because they like the swimming. Um, And if they don't like it, they don't. I think when you're a swimmer and you're you've committed to swimming, you probably have a little less time to devote to other areas, but I think it's actively looking for roles that are outside of the pool, you know, whether that's with other friends, I think you actually, I think you have to be thoughtful around what's going to actually compete with swimming, right? Like we want you to have an internship that's going to be able to support 
your time in the pool. And I think you or your parents might have to be a little more active in finding a role or a job for you that's going to allow you to also swim at the level that you want to. But I think it's really, really important that you try and do that as best you can. So I was a preschool teacher every other, pre- like in the summers, every other preschool teacher had to get there at 8 a.m. And fortunately, my director kind of knew me and she said, I didn't have to get there till nine. So I swam in the morning barely took a shower and I was there at nine. And so I think making sure you're looking for other roles as frequently as you can to enhance your swimming, not to take away from it. That's really interesting. I I like that. Looking for other things to enhance the swimming, Mm -hmm. not take away, even, even if, uh, you know, something might take away from your time in the pool, that doesn't necessarily mean it has to not enhance it. Um, I think I know when you were corresponding with our editor, Braden, he brought this up, but you know, we saw Nick Fink this year coming off of making an Olympic team. He decided to pursue a master's degree in engineering at Georgia tech, completely moved training locations and was definitely less committed to the sport than he had been before. Um, he, you know, he would practice when he could, but you know, ultimately he just wasn't getting in as much water time. He went best times this year in uh, short course meters and long course he made the world championship team in all three breaststroke events. I'm pretty sure. Um, so it's, I mean, it, you know, just that's one a, example. I mean, that's amazing. And I think, and I don't know anything about Nick Fink, like who he is, but I think it is an example of kind of, sometimes I think we're spending a lot of time in the water, right. And maybe we don't need to be spending as much time in the water. Um, or it could be like when we are spending so much time in the, in the water, all we're doing is thinking about swimming. And so when you have something else to give that brain space to, you're actually, you're actually going to put yourself in a better performance mode because performance is actually in a bell curve with anxiety. So if you think about a bell curve, as your anxiety increases, your performance is going to increase, but at some point you're going to hit the tipping point. And so when your anxiety increases, your performance is going to start slowly decreasing. And so it could be that, you know, if you don't have all those other roles and all those other parts of your identity, your your just anxiety and your dependence on the sport is too much. I think we, and I think we've seen quite a few examples of that in swimming recently, but that's, that's one. Um, and that makes a lot of sense, right? Is that Again, you want some level of anxiety, but you want to find that good balance at the top of the bell curve. So we talked about, you know, kind of think about that Coleman, because absolutely thing I tell people the most um, is that it's really easy when you're like a teenager or you're in college. We get these very objective measures of who we are and how we're performing. And when I say objective measure, I mean like a time, right? Say you want to go, I don't know. 58 and a hundred fly. And you're like, this is my goal. And you go a 59 and you're like, I'm a terrible person. I have this objective measure, right? I did not hit my goal. I'm going to, this is, I'm, I'm a failure, right? Because these times are so concrete, but life isn't about times. It's an easy objective measure, but, but ultimately life and who you are, isn't really about how fast you're swimming. You have all these other values that don't, you're not measured on every day, right? How kind you are, how hard, how hard working you are, um, how giving you are, how generous you are, but we don't objectively measure these things. And we don't reflect on them every time we touch the wall and look at the pace clock. And so I think part of it is remembering at the end of the day that, that you're never going to get a number on your true values. So don't actually measure yourself against those times on the pace clock when it really matters. I'm really cheesy. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, this, you know, sometimes it's the simplest things or the cheesiest things, right? I mean, maybe we should get graded <laughs> on our, uh, on how kind we are every day to strangers or mm-hmm. to, to not strangers, to the people we're interacting with. Um, I, I, I mean, I love that point. That's a really great point. And it's, I think, especially younger kids, uh, we can, can really get caught. Well, probably any athlete can re- get really caught up in those numbers or how yeah. am I performing according to these metrics when, um, again, at the end of the day, competition should probably be 
uh, number two to enjoying your sport and enjoying what you're doing. Uh, so we've talked about kind of managing mentality outside of the pool, right? Let's talk about managing mentality inside the pool, uh, with number three, you know, how do you deal with the stress that comes with training every day or even the stress, the highs and the lows that can come with the taper. Mm -hmm. And we were talking about this earlier. I think one of the things about emotions that I still as a 40 year old forget is that they come and they go, right? So when we're having a really, really hard time, sometimes it can feel like that feeling is going to stay with us forever and there's no way out. And what we actually know is that emotions, like I think essentially the definition of an emotion is that it's going to leave. We've never been like mad for 70 days straight. We've never been happy for 70 days straight. Those feelings will go. And, and there are absolutely hard times that come with swimming. I think that we've talked about typically people can be either more anxious and depressed during the, the meat of their training cycle, their balance can be a little wonky. And so it really is all about swimming. I think there can also be some anxiety and depression during tapering because you're not getting the same endorphins or disappointment after a championship meet. Right. But the point is, is that you're going to have a lot of highs and lows and, and realizing that something is going to change, right? If you, if you're going to taper, if you hate your training cycle, no, you're going to taper. Or if you hate taper, no, you're going to have that meat. Um, and so you don't have to feel stuck in that moment. Those feelings will change. And to be honest with you, that's one of the reasons why I have my, like my swimming notebook, like a, you know, like a crazy person is because, I'm one of those people that gets anxious during taper. I'm like, oh, like I'm not swimming the way I was my last taper. And that makes me really anxious and I will spin about it. But because I've written down how I've tapered for the last, I don't know, three years, I can look back at what I was doing this time before and not overreact to it. I'm like, oh, wait, like I'm right in line where I was last time. Things are good. And it really helps me manage my own anxiety. It's really funny because, uh, you know, I was, I swam through high school and now I am absolutely not a competitive athlete anymore. I still swim to stay fit. And, uh, but I don't, I don't like competing (laughs) pretty Mm -hmm. much at all, um, in, in an athletic sense, but my mom is now, uh, runs ultra marathons. And so she's kind of, uh, the athlete, um, at least in terms of, of me and her, that dynamic kind of switched. And so it's funny talking to her when she's tapering for a big race, she goes through a lot of the similar things that I went through, um, as a swimmer, when I would taper for a big meet. Um, and yeah, just talking to her, she's, she's a pretty mindful person generally. And so she can kind of manage those highs and lows, but you know, sometimes she asks, uh, for advice or just my take on something when she's going through that period. And, um, It's kind of funny because at least as swimmers, we view taper as this like, yes, it's, it's taper time. Mm -hmm. We love this. Um, and a lot with that expectation, we don't always um, anticipate the lows of it too. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, resting's just supposed to feel good and it's supposed to be great, but sometimes and training's supposed to be really hard, but sometimes the opposite can happen. Sometimes you find a, you're in a great training cycle and you never want to leave it. And then you start the taper and it's like, I feel terrible. What's happening. Mm -hmm. And then you're anxious and you're like, I wish this would stop. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. And so, uh, it's, it's, (laughs) it's an interesting space, but, you know, again, coming to terms with the fact that it's, it's not, it's everything's impermanent, right. The, especially the emotions and the feelings physically and mentally, um, Mm -hmm one, one thing's it's going to, it's going to pass one way or the other. And I think the piece is, it's really hard to tell yourself that in the moment, especially like you're talking about your mom, who I'm assuming is maybe older than me. Right. And I'm 40. So I know that, like, I have that perspective. Um, and I don't think I was really, I don't, I remember really learning that at age 28, to be honest with you. And so if you are one of those athletes that really is feeling exceptionally bad or even not exceptionally bad. If you're just like, I've been feeling pretty bad for a long period of time, it's really important that you let someone know, right? I think ultimately 
we have a lot of people on our team and it feels like they're on our team to support our swimming success, right? We have coaches, we have teammates, we have um, trainers, we have, and we have friends hopefully too. Any single one of those people would so much you rather be um, happy and healthy than swimming fast. And I know it might not feel that way in the moment, but it's absolutely the truth at the end of the day. And sometimes you just need a reminder. And so I think if you could say to a parent or a friend or a coach, like, hey, I'm really struggling. Maybe I need to see a therapist. What do you think? Or I'm really struggling. Is this normal? And I think beginning to talk about it is going to be, is going to be the one, number one way to help you if you're feeling those feelings. So that's a great reminder, a great point. It feel a, a lot of times it can feel like, oh, my teammate, it, my, my merit, my worth is dependent on whether I swim fast or not with my coach, with my teammates, with my family. Uh, but you know, all of them, even in a swimming environment are there to support you as the person, right? Mm -hmm. You as the swimmer and you as the, every other, other thing that, that you are as well. Um, Mm -hmm. all those other identities you are, they're just there to support you, not Mm -hmm. just you, the swimmer. Absolutely. And, and the other piece I really wanted to share about that is, one of the things I do is I know there's tons of hard things that happen when I'm swimming. Like I did not want to go to some practice yesterday. I'm 41. I have terrible shoulders. My coach made me do 30 fifties fly. I was like, what, why, why? Right. Um, but one of the reasons I do it is that I very actively practice reminding myself of the joys of swimming. So every day for about 30 seconds, I, visualize one of those times where like, I just felt like a badass, right? So I think about when I won the 200 fly at at masters nationals, just that 10 minutes, I have never felt so good or just a really good workout with a friend. And we just like talk trash and I won every time I I didn't really, but I do like to talk trash. Um, but just like reminding yourself of those fun times, but actively reminding yourself, putting that in your body and remembering that it could also be laughing in the locker room. That's just as fun and just as important to swimmers. So instead of just like, we all complain about swim practice, we all kind of dread it at times when we're doing that, make sure you're also leaving space to remember the really fun reasons that we're doing it because it really is supposed to be here for fun. We just have to practice remembering it kind of being mindful of the joys of swimming. (laughs) That should be the title of something, but I I love that point. Um, I think that's a great point. I think that's a great way to kind of wrap up our, our discussion on those three topics and the deeper dive in them. Um, but before we sign off, I want to get a little more in depth about you and your chlorinated history. Um, as you mentioned, I forgot to mention it. You are a master's national champion in the 200 fly, no less, which, uh, we at swim, swam are big 200 fly fans. We're 200. No, fly I think people, so. no one my age wanted to train for it. I'm the only fool who's saying I will do it. Um, <laughs> but it was really, really fun. I feel, again, I feel really fortunate. I train out of the master's team in Charlottesville and we have, like 70 year olds on the team that have world records. It's, it's really, really cool to see people at all ages, kill it and work hard every day. So, uh, yeah, again, let's get into your swimming background. how did you get into swimming? Were you a a swimmer in high school or you swimmer in college? What's how, how did it all start for you? I swam through high school. I swam at Arlington Aquatic Club um, with Ward Foley. And then Evan Stiles was the assistant coach at the time. Um, And I loved it. He's now the head coach. Tori Husk's club team for our younger listeners. It's so amazing. It's really cool to see him on TV. He was an amazing coach when he was like 25 also, by the way. Um, And so, oh, shoot, I forgot what I was going to say. So, oh, I know. So we, my coach Ward really like got me. I was a really, really hard worker, but I didn't always perform um, at meets. And so he actually pulled me into, I was, I was a swimmer's rep for USA Swimming. 
um, which was really cool. So he kind of helped me develop an identity in swimming that wasn't all about performance. So I would go to the conferences and I would, I did that for four years. Um, I did not swim in college, but I had another identity in swimming that wasn't just performing at meets. And then I didn't swim for 20 years or something. And then um, I saw coach E Don Easterling at the Y and I was like, maybe I'll go. And he tricked me into swimming nationals and it was fun. How did he trick you into swimming nationals? You know what he did? He, he didn't talk to me for six weeks and then he made me do a 50 fly time trial. He waited two weeks and then said that would have been top five in the country. Just so you know, like, don't look back when the lights, something like don't, don't get old and look back and wish you would have when the lights were on or something like that. And it, it really, I was like, okay, coach E, I'm going to go to nationals. And I did. And, um, coronavirus hit the next year. And so thank goodness I took that opportunity when I had it. He was absolutely right. That was the year I had to do it. Wow. That is inspiring stuff. <laughs> That's awesome. Uh, it's really cool. And, and now you're just churning out 30 fifties butterfly. I mean, <laughs> barely, but yes, trying to. And you're finding the fun in it all the while, which to me is the more amazing part. Yeah. I mean, it's cool to be 41 and I'm almost faster than I was when I was 18. Um, and that's pretty cool. And I think it's really cool to be coached by someone who, who doesn't have tons of skin in the game, right? He's just giving me his knowledge, but he doesn't have a lot of weight on it, right? He's just, it's all giving. Does that make sense at all? Absolutely. Um, someone recommended, uh, I was in Charlottesville to film a few practices with UVA and with Cavalier Aquatics. And someone recommended like, you have to get Don Easterling on the podcast uh, cause he'll have a bazillion stories. And so he's been on my radar. Um, I need to contact him because uh, he, you know, uh, he's, he's highly regarded in the swimming community. Oh, and he is still there yelling at me to get in the water. <laughs> I mean, at this, you know, I'm like, okay, coach, I'll get in. You know, I feel like when I see him, I'm happy to see him. a feeling that all swimmers are familiar with. Right? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> um, so I am, I'm curious again, you're the CEO of Virginia family therapy. You work with a lot of teenagers and a lot of young athletes there. Um, at this mental health practice. So I know when I started coaching, I learned so much more by teaching than I ever did by being an athlete and by being a swimmer, right? I, now when I swim, you know, I think about so many more technical things than I ever did when mm -hmm. I was actually competing and swimming. Um, so, you know, from the mental side of it, you know, from working with young athletes, um, what do you feel like you've gained, or maybe just what's one thing that stands out, um, you know, that, that you have gained from working with these young athletes who are going through it at, as you speak to them versus when you were a younger athlete? You know, one thing, this is ridiculous, but I think what you just said is like actually kind of listening to your coaches, your coach, when your coaches are giving you instructions get faster. I think that I would kind of, when I was, when I was younger, I would be like, Oh, I think I'm doing that. I think I'm doing that. But now I really pay attention to my body. And I, just like you said, I actually am honed into every single thing that I'm doing. Um, and I think that's why I'm swimming faster than I ever was before is because I'm really listening to my coaches. That's awesome. <laughs> great, great advice. This is from a mental health professional listener. So you really want to listen to her, listen to your coaches, take their advice. Uh, Amanda, it's been so great chatting with you about this really great topic. Thank you for bringing it up. Thank you for uh, giving us the, the content to publish an article about it. Do you have any parting thoughts for our audience before we sign off today? No, just that I think it's really important to think about you as a person before before you as a swimmer. And I think it's really hard um, when we love our sport and it takes up so much of our brain space. But I think being a person is always more important. And if you feel like you need help, whether it's just with the mental health piece, 
just general anxiety, depression, or if you want help kind of performance wise, um, you can reach out, right? People are there, sports psychologists are there, therapists are there. Um, Michael Phelps is on BetterHelp. We have Virginia Family Therapy. There's so many options and it's really, really important to just let someone know and reach out. More and more people are doing it and you're not alone. You've been listening to the Swim Swam podcast. Stay tuned for new episodes every week. You can take Swim Swam podcasts on the go by subscribing on your favorite podcast platform. Look for links in the description below and be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more videos as well.